and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, 1917's George Mackay is Ned Kelly, starring alongside an all-star cast that includes Nicholas Holt and Russell Crowe in Justin Curzel's True History of the Kelly Gag. Ned Kelly plays a child by Orlando Schwerd, endures a tough childhood growing up in rural Australia, and after the death of his father, Red, played by Ben Corbett, Ned is sold by his mother, Ellen, played by Essie Davis, to notorious bush ranger, Harry Power, played by Russell Crowe. Growing into a man, now played by George Mackay, Ned forms the infamous Kelly gang with his brother, Dan, played by Earl Cave, and friends Joe Byrne and Steve Hart, played by Sean Keenan and Lewis Hewson, who are pursued by the twisted Constable Fitzpatrick, played by Nicholas Holt. The story of the notorious Australian bushranger Ned Kelly has been brought to the screen numerous times before, all of which have had decidedly mixed results. For example, in 1970, Mick Jagger played Kelly in a legendarily terrible production. More recently, in 2003, Heath Ledger played Kelly in a surprisingly dull film considering the talent involved. This latest movie is adapted from Peter Carey's 2000 book of the same name, which was hugely critically acclaimed. The film is directed by Justin Curzel, who is best known for his moody, atmospheric adaptation of Macbeth, but had a huge stumble with the big Hollywood video game adaptation of Assassin's Creed. This essentially brings Curzel back to basics, even re-teaming with the same screenwriter of his debut, Snowtown. The film's title is meant to be ironic. It's not actually based in fact. The book that it's based on was heavily fictionalized, and the first thing that you see in the film is a title card that says none of what you're about to see is true with the last word segueing into the actual title card although really if they were going to spin a fiction you would have thought they made a better yarn than this. Perhaps the reason why Ned Kelly has been so hard to pin down on screen is that his legacy remains divided. How do you portray someone like that? As some Robin Hood-esque folk hero? Or as a murdering thug? And that subjectivity is baked into true history of the Kelly gang, especially in its framing device taken from the book that it's based on, where Ned is writing his life story as a series of letters addressed to his daughter, who incidentally didn't actually exist. So this implies some level of authority because it's coming directly from the horse's mouth, but how much can we actually trust Ned to be a reliable narrator, especially given that so much of what he speaks of differs from what we actually know about Kelly's life? This implies that Kelly's legend has already superseded him, that this is a vain attempt at trying to set the record straight and trying to correct any falsehoods that might have emerged about him. And in that way, it also implies that this is not meant to be taken at face Value. This is not meant to be literal, it's meant to be an exaggeration and gives the creators full license to toy and experiment with Australian folklore and deconstruct it. In fact, if anything, the movie has a very modern anachronistic vibe to it. It's almost punky in how much it's trying to go against that kind of established order of what we think we know about both Ned Kelly and the time period. It's very experimental in its approach. One of the biggest surprises about the film is just how much time is spent focused on Ned's formative years. Much of the first hour is devoted to Ned growing up with his very isolated, dysfunctional family that is effectively ruled over by his mother Ellen, played in a ferocious turn by Essie Davis, who is equal parts maternal, but also very tough, bordering on cruel. And that's because she has had to fight to survive and she also feels guilty internally about what she's subjecting her children to and the sacrifices that she's had to make and it boils over into these rants about the weakness of the men in her life, especially Ned's father Red who is characterised as failing to provide for his family and thus Ellen has resorted to sex work to try and help keep the family afloat. The first time we even 
see her in the film, it's Ned glancing through a shack and has seeing her having sex with another man, in this case Sergeant no O'Neill, played by Charlie Hunnam, which only refers to undermine and emasculate Ned's father in his own eyes, and that's even before rumours of his potential sexuality. And this establishes true history of the Kelly gang as being a portrait of masculinity in crisis, because Ned is growing up without a strong father figure in his life for much of the running time, at least in the early going, until the arrival of Harry Power, who is a notorious Australian bushranger in his own right, who surprisingly is only given his first film incarnation in this movie, but played extremely memorably by Russell Crowe. Perhaps the reason why Curzel indulges in this section of the movie so much is that it's got two of his biggest stars in it, and you've got Hunnam, but especially Crowe, who is fantastic as this larger-than-life figure. Yes, he may well be past his prime, but he's still feared and still dangerous, and Crowe makes the most of his very limited screen time, reveling in one scene in particular where he gets to use his singing abilities on an obscene ditty that has a wordplay on the word constable and the C word. And honestly, Crow is so brilliant in this film that arguably I wouldn't have minded watching an entire film based around him. Really though, it's under Powers' apprenticeship does Kelly find some form of masculine role model, and that education is bathed in blood. Little wonder then that the man that he'll grow up to be is as volatile as he'll become. It's also not surprising that the movie has a theme of castration running all throughout it, again tying in with these ideas of male insecurity and that literally comes to a head in the confrontation between Power and O'Neill, with Ned in the middle of it being goaded by Power to shoot O'Neill's genitals off. Really, after that scene, the movie doesn't quite know what to do with itself, all of these characters who vanish from the film, and it's unfortunate because those two make such a sizable impression, and then their absence is very keenly felt. When George Mackay does finally enter the film at around the halfway point, he gets a formidable introduction. It's a bare-knuckle boxing match, and Ned is standing in front of this huge Union Jack with his body bent backwards, his back arched in an almost unnatural way that makes the muscles on his lean frame bulge out. He has this animalistic, feral quality, as if he was this barely contained coil of rage. It's a striking visual, and one that establishes this version of Kelly as one that has a lot of seething resentment and rage bubbling under the surface. Mackay characterises Kelly as someone who wants to do well for himself, but is blighted by circumstance. He is forced by the pressures of living up to his mother and her expectations of his masculinity, and also the authorities pressuring down on him. He almost becomes like a sort of tragic figure in that way, and Mackay's performance is almost like a guttural howl in some scenes, especially as his Kelly gets more and more wild as the film progresses and less civilised as he and the gang go out on their duties. Mackay's performance is extremely unguarded and he does a fantastic Australian accent as well. But this insecure, uncertain Kelly doesn't quite anchor the film in the way that it really should do. It often feels like, despite the fact that he's the narrator, a lot of Kelly's actual intensity is eaten up by many of the supporting characters who are just as big as he is, and perhaps more distinctive. But you can tell that Mackay is throwing himself into the role, especially as someone who is getting nervous as one of the most interesting actors of his generation and really trying to incorporate in his turn that anarchic spirit that characterises so much of the movie, especially in its approach to authority. The British and the law in this film are represented as corrupt and depraved. There's a moment where Harry tells young Ned, 
write your own legend because if you leave it to the British, they'll F it up. There is a sense that everything the British touch is corroded in some way. Of course, this is first seen with Hunnam's O'Neill, but this is especially prominent with Nicholas Holt's Constable Fitzpatrick, who is just odious. It's another one of those characters that Holt seems drawn to from time to time of just being the most vile, despicable, detestable characters. That kind of bug-eyed, almost OTT intensity that he brings to the role definitely adds something to the movie. You're never quite sure what Fitzpatrick is going to do because he is a fiend, he is a pervert, and a coward. And it just seems like any time that Holt is on screen, something is going to happen, especially in one particularly terrifying moment where as he holds a baby on his arm, he then puts a gun to its head. That's the sort of character that Holt is playing on screen. But again, that character doesn't really get a satisfactory conclusion at the end of the film. It feels like the movie is really, really patchy. I would definitely argue that Cazell is a visualist. He knows how to craft an arresting image. That's one of the biggest strengths of his movies, and True History of the Kelly Gang is no exception. His cinematography of the Australian locations that he uses is breathtaking at times. He really manages to craft something out of the desolate, barren landscapes that makes you feel alone and vulnerable, but it also feels foreboding and threatening at the same time. However, I would not argue that Cazell is a storyteller because true history feels extremely uneven, especially in terms of its editing and structure. Again, because I think Cazell has spent too much on what is essentially the first act of the movie, what ends up happening is that the main body of the plot ends up being crammed into this second hour, and as a result, you've got a movie that simultaneously feels both sluggish and rushed simultaneously. That's almost an accomplishment. It feels elliptical in all the wrong places. It often feels like scenes aren't actually properly held together. In isolation, the scenes work very well, but they don't work to tell a story. It often feels like crucial pieces have been left out, and it just feels really disjointed. It doesn't feel like Cazell has a good feeling for the the story that he's trying to tell and wrestling with too many themes at the same time. And so what ends up occurring is the movie essentially ends up as being a catalogue of ultra-violence. It's just a series of abuses and indignities and assaults played out on screen. And to some extent, this is intentional. The movie is trying to wrestle with the legacy of Australia's past in much the same way as something like The Nightingale is. The film is extremely confrontational, but rarely Rarely does it feel coherent. It often feels like it's just grabbing you by the pals and thrusting you face first into the ugliness of it all. This is especially true of the character of Mary, played by Thomas N. Mackenzie, recently seen in Jojo Rabbit. And that is a fictional character who Ned falls in love with and has a daughter with. And that character being a woman and the closest thing to an innocent in this story is subjected to the worst of the film's violence and a grievances. That character is really ran through its squalid mill, and Mackenzie does the best that she can with that kind of material. The fact the movie is also so abbreviated also means that key elements of it feel very short-changed, like, oh, say, the Kelly gang in the title. It's two-thirds of the way through before the gang even forms, and then most of it is them running around in dresses because Ned argues they'll confound the enemy. This again plays into this idea of male insecurity and confusion, but also this strain of homoeroticism, especially in the relationship between Kelly and Fitzpatrick that is unspoken but extremely palpable. But none of the other members of the Kelly gang are really characters in their 
own right, they barely figure into the movie at all. And by the time of their last stand, their confrontation with the police, it feels like Kurzel's style is overwhelming the movie. I can make a case for the fact that the narrowing aspect ratio encaptures the idea of Ned being increasingly tense and enclosed as he's being surrounded by the forces, but then, for some reason, Kurzel stages the entire climax in this stroboscopic landscape. There are several sequences where Kurzel lights scenes with an extremely fast blinking strobe. There's a moment where Ned stands against the landscape in front of his house and the lighting makes him look monstrous. Monstrous, but it's a trick that Kazell uses ad nauseum. If you have any kind of epilepsy, you cannot see this movie. It's by far at its worst at the very end of it, where the Kellys are surrounded by cops wearing these luminous, reflective, phosphorescent cloaks that borderline make them look like clansmen, and the lights are blinking in and out for five to ten minutes straight. And look, I get it. Kazell is trying to be experimental here. He's trying to put us in the psychology of the characters, the fear and intensity of that moment. But there's also the literal intensity of the flashing on screen to the point where it was giving me a migraine, to be honest. It's a point where style makes the movie borderline unwatchable. True History of the Kelly Gang certainly tries to be a bold, distinctive take on the Ned Kelly story. Story. It also feels like someone yelling in your face for two hours. Yes, there are things about this movie that do work. In fits and starts, you can kind of see what the movie wanted to be, especially thanks to strong performances from virtually its entire cast. I just don't think that Kazell can actually marshal all the ideas or the story that he wants to bring to the screen. He knows how to convey an image but not to give it any more meaning or structure beyond that. It feels like he's taken fairly strong source material and used it as cinematic buckshot. This really does feel like there's no real kind of direction to it, and as such, it renders a lot of it fairly impotent. By the end of the movie, it just feels like we've just wallowed in just sheer unpleasant Nurse. It feels like the worst of punk in some ways, in that its posturing is just empty provocation. True History of the Kelly Gang tries to interrogate the Australian legend with a fictionalised telling of his story that has an anachronistic punk vibe, but Justin Cazell's film is an extremely uneven experience. There's no denying that Cazell is great as a visualist, often achieving a savage beauty from the harsh Australian landscapes, but the style of the film is overwhelming at the expense of the story, especially in the seizure-inducing finale. The structure of the film is both sluggish and erratic, spending too much time on Kelly's childhood, with the second half and adulthood trying to cram in too much, often feeling more like violent episodes strung together. Although the film boasts tenacious performances from Davis, Holt and Crow, and George Mackay cuts a Ned Kelly rooted in insecure masculinity, this is a confrontational work that hollers at full volume, but with a little sense of articulation. If you like this review, then ride on over to my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.